Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Blair, for introducing me, and thank you all for having me up here once again to talk to you. And I promise to be even more provocative than I tried to be yesterday in my presentation. Uh, these are my disclosures, same as yesterday, as with Paul. So I could actually save you a lot of time this morning and do the following. I could just punt. I could punt and say, refer all patients with pulmonary nodules to thoracic surgery for evaluation. Pulmonologists shouldn't be involved in the evaluation. Thoracic surgeons are going to resect them, so. <laughs> Next. <laughs> that would be very easy. And that's what you want to hear. But I'm going to try to convince you over the next, I don't know, however long Blair lets me speak, that that's not the case, that I think that we can work as a team together to help these patients. And maybe I won't convince you, but I'm going to try. And by the way, I am from Buffalo, and we do punt a lot since we lost four Super Bowls about 14 years ago. So these are the pulmonary nodule concerns for pulmonologists that we have that um, surgeons don't have necessarily so much. But when I see a patient with a pulmonary nodule, my first thing that I worry about and that any pulmonologist should worry about is, am I going to miss a curable cancer? Am I going to sit on somebody for too long and they end up with lymph node metastasis and then I've just shot myself in the foot every which way? Will I end up ordering too many CT scans on patients who didn't need them? Will I be making my patient anxious unnecessarily? When should I order a PET scan? Should I order a PET scan? When should I perform a bronchoscopy? Should I ever perform a bronchoscopy for a pulmonary nodule? Should I send the patient for a needle biopsy? Is that the right thing to do? And is SBR2, SBRT as good as surgery for a possible cancer? I'm not going to answer that question today. But these are the things that go through most pulmonologists' mind when they see a patient with a pulmonary nodule. And I think the game changer is that as many pulmonary nodules as you think you're seeing in your practice, Wait till we have routine guidelines for CT screening because the game changer is here. The game changer is the NLST, and we've all heard about it, I think, ad nauseum and ad infinitum, but it's going to change all of our practices. And my, argue is that, my argument is that we're going to be so inundated with patients with pulmonary nodules that you're going to want the pulmonologist to help you because you, can't, you won't be able to see all those patients yourself in your office hours. So what is a pulmonary nodule? Again, you've heard this a thousand times. I'm going to go through this portion quickly and then get to the provocative part of my talk. So what are we talking about? We're talking about a single, but more often now multiple, spherical, well-circumscribed radiographic opacities less than three centimeters in diameter, 30 millimeters. Again, I hear a lot of talk about patients with pulmonary nodules, which are four centimeters. That's a mass. We're not talking about masses. We're talking about nodules. It has to be completely surrounded by aerated lung, it can't be associated with atelectasis, hyalur enlargement, or pleural effusion. And in terms of looking at the algorithm for diagnosis and management, I refer you to this month's issue of CHEST, where there's a fantastic review of pulmonary nodule diagnosis and management. And I think that if you read that, you may not need the first portion of my talk. So in the CT scan era, as opposed to the chest x-ray era, era Nodules are classified based on size, and we know that the larger the nodule, and this almost makes perfect sense, the more likelihood it's cancer. The number of nodules is important. The grouping of nodules is important. The shape of the nodules is important. Thousands of papers have been published in literature about the shape of nodules. And then to top things off, if things weren't complicated enough about following pulmonary nodules, we now have three types of nodules that we have to think about different algorithms for following. So we have ground glass nodules, which I think are the chronic cough for thoracic surgeons. You know, pulmonologists hate seeing patients with a chronic cough. They're the bane of our existence. For you guys, getting this patient into your office is you don't know what to do with this patient. Then you have the patient with a solid nodule. That's more easy. That should, 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 that should come out. And then we've got these semi-solid nodules. And literally, we're going to have algorithms for how to follow all of these patients radiographically and when to intervene. The differential diagnosis of pulmonary nodules, well, we all are familiar with this. I'm not going to go into great detail. But again, what we're thinking about, what we're worried about is lung cancer. We don't want to miss is lung cancer. Most of the time, if you miss a metastasis, you may not impact upon the patient's longevity. The rest of these should be self-evident on the basis of imaging and, and other medical testing. So again, the size of the cancer, uh, the larger you get, the, the more likely it is cancer. 
the more lobulated or spiculated, the more likely it's cancer. And in the pulmonary literature, I think I spent half the time on my pulmonary boards looking at different patterns of calcification, which I've never seen ever again, that are supposed to tell me whether or not a nodule is benign or malignant. Again, I don't think in this era that that's all that helpful, except for the completely calcified nodule, which is almost certainly benign. So this is a fantastic paper from Dave Ose, from Andy Anderson, and Michael Gould, from the Blue Journal from 2011. This was really interesting because it looked at probability of cancer and treatment thresholds and observation thresholds. And what it said was that there's a certain threshold in the probability of cancer in which you should just do surgery and not do additional testing. And there's a low threshold for probability of cancer in which observation, and this got cut off with serial CT, CT scan, is the right thing to do. But that these thresholds shift. So as Blair develops more minimally invasive techniques to operate on patients, the threshold for surgery should shift in this direction, even with a lower probability of cancer, because the harm to the patient will be less. But if the patient uh, it has risk factors which are very low, almost none, and the, sh and the probability of cancer shifts this way, well, an observation threshold uh, will be higher. So I think that this is a moving target. And whether to do needle biopsy or PET scan really de depends upon this intermediate or indeterminate nodule category. We've all heard uh, very commonly about PET scans and their role in pulmonary nodules. Not all that useful, I would say, for the most part, for patients who have a high risk. If so, if you have a pre-test probability that the patient has lung cancer and they have a spiculated mass, it's going to be a lung cancer more often than not. But we know that they have very high sensitivity and specificity for lung nodules. Uh, but there are false positives that we've all seen, as well as false negatives. So I don't necessarily get PET scans for evaluating the pulmonary nodule, but they are important for staging. And I think that's, that's important when we talk about pulmonary nodules, that even this, which is not really a nodule, but it's a mass, to get the PET scan to identify an occult lymph node metastasis is important, as well as distant metastases. When we evaluate pulmonary nodules, we've been using the Fleischner guidelines, but as I mentioned, these are primarily for solid nodules. And we can look at, solid, we look at the size of the nodule, and we look at the risk of the nodule. And there are specific guidelines for the frequency of CT scans that you can look up that tell you how often you should be following patients. But again, now that we have different designations for ground glass nodules, semi-solid nodules, and solid nodules, we have to distinguish among them for the treatment or the diagnosis algorithm. About uh, <clears throat> six years ago, the ACCB publishes guidelines, which included guidelines for following pulmonary nodules, a new set of guidelines, and a new set of Fleischner Society guidelines will be coming out in the next year. The, as many of you may have participated in the ACCP guideline production. Uh, they, these were completed last fall and we published relatively soon. So this is from the paper in chess that came out this month. And again, I encourage you to look at it. And some of it is pretty self-evident. So if you have a, a nodule which is detected on chest, chest x-ray, the recommendations are to look at old films, assess its stability over two years, look for that classic benign pattern of calcification, and if it's been stable over two years, if it's fully calcified, no further workup is necessary. If these are not available or, you, or they're not stable, um, recommendation is for a CT scan. You're looking for whether it's a solid or a sub-solid nodule, and this includes uh, partially solid and ground glass nodules. And if you've got a solid nodule and it's greater than 8 millimeter di in diameter and you look at the pretest probability for lung cancer and it's very high, those patients should probably go directly to surgery. If the patients aren't ready for surgery, they should get some sort of biopsy and then get surgery. If you have the very low risk pretest probability for lung cancer, less than 5%, then I think it's safe to do serial CT scans on these patients, even with greater than 8 millimeter nodules. But for anyone else in this category who's got an intermediate nodule, they should get PET scan. If positive, go to surgery. If negative, to be followed and look for interval growth. If they're late, less than eight millimeters, you can follow the Fleischner Society guidelines as I showed you on the previous slide. For subsolid nodules, then you have to divide them up into pure GGOs, which are less than five millimeters, in which the recommendations are no further follow-up. Pure GGOs or GGNs that are greater than five millimeters in which a repeat scan at five months and then yearly low dose CT scans to follow. If there's a change in size of this even pure GGN, the recommendation is for surgery. For partly solid components, repeat three, a thin section CT at three months. 
If the nodule's unchanged and the solid component is greater than eight, get a PET scan. Other recommendations, depending upon the change in the nodule, uh, have to do with the characteristics of the nodule that you see. But interestingly, these are the recommendations. Surgical resection for these partly solid nodules that are, being great, that are greater than eight millimeters uh, is strongly considered. So the last part of my talk is going to be on a more controversial topic, which is, is there a role for bronchoscopy? This is a paper from CHEST from last year, which was from a Netherlands lung cancer screening trial. So the Netherlands, they did a lung cancer screening trial similar to the NLST, and they took all screen positive participants who had a pulmonary nodule and subjected them to bronchoscopy. And the bottom line is that the yield on bronchoscopy for establishing a diagnosis, this is standard white light bronchoscopy, was 12.5%, with a median nodule side of 14 millimeters. So for those patients that we're gonna find on the basis of NLST screening, standard white light bronchoscopy has no role. So you can tell your pulmonologist who do routine bronchoscopy for a pulmonary nodule that for a screen nodule, there is no evidence that white light bronchoscopy plays any role whatsoever. And that's the current recommendation. And I think I lost some slides here. So unfortunately, I have a couple slides which are, which are missing, but I would say that there is, there's a good meta-analysis that came out in chest in the last year from Gerard Silvestri from Medical University of South Carolina, which showed that guided bronchoscopy actually does play a significant role, that the yield of guided bronchoscopy using any technique, including electromagnetic bronchoscopy, radial EBUS, uh, and virtual bronchoscopy is about 70%. The yield of trans needle biopsy is about 80 to 90%, but the risk of, tr of pneumothorax after needle biopsy done trans is about 25% with a 6% chest tube rate, whereas the risk of pneumothorax with guided bronchoscopic biopsy is somewhere around 2.5%. So when I advise patients about if they're going to get a biopsy, I tell them about the higher yield of trans biopsy, but the higher risk of pneumothorax with guided bronchoscopy, lower yield, but still pretty good yield, but a lower risk of complications. The diagnosis of peripheral lesions has changed with the advent of about 10 years ago, radial endobronchial ultrasound, which also allows you to characterize the nodules. And in the last five to eight years, the development of electromagnetic and navigational bronchoscopy. All right, here's the meta-analysis. I just rearranged my slides. This is the median data here showing about a 70% yield for the diagnosis of pulmonary nodules and the differential rates of pneumothoraces. And this slide I think is important because many of you may be considering investments in expensive technologies to diagnose peripheral nodules. And here you'll see that a virtual bronchoscopy, electromagnetic bronchoscopy, radial EBUS all have about the same yield in terms of diagnosis of small nodules. And so you can decide on your technologies based upon cost effectiveness. In the future, bronchoscopy diagnosis of pulmonary nodules may not depend upon the airways. Currently, any technology you're going to use, guided bronchoscopy, electromagnetic bronchoscopy, relies upon the airways. In the future, computers will be able to take us through a point of entry in an avascular path to a peripheral nodule through the lung parenchyma and to put a sheath out there and to biopsy the nodule successfully and also to do whatever you want to the nodule, to ablate it, to uh, potentially even um, uh, get on-site sampling and make an on-site diagnosis from this lesion. We also can do bronchoscopy for pulmonary nodules to get genomic analysis. So there's a multi-center tr clinical trial which has recently been completed at Cruel in which patients who have a pulmonary nodule, uncertain whether it's cancer, have a bronchoscopic brushing of a contralateral main stem bronchus to obtain genomic material of normal bronchial epithelium and can then do a microarray analysis which can distinguish between whether the patient has a nodule which is cancerous or non-cancerous with a sensitivity and specificity of greater than 90%. And so even if you can't make the diagnosis of cancer or no cancer on the nodule, you may get genomic information that can guide you as to whether surgery for this nodule is appropriate. So what about a role for bronchoscopy in the management of the pulmonary nodule? Well, uh, for about five to six years uh, in Europe and the United States, radio probe ultrasound has been used to guide peripheral interventions for lung cancers in non-surgical patients, in this case, brachytherapy. Uh, we can obtain material for genetic analysis 
from radial ultrasound guided biopsies that can then guide medical therapy, in this case, obtaining material for EGFR mutations that can guide the administration of gefitinib or erlotinib. Um, I can be asked by our radiation oncologist, for example, to place fiducials using either radial or linear probe ultrasound uh, to use this for SBRT. And there have been reports of using bronchoscopic guidance for video thoracoscopic resection of lung nodules. So this is a report from uh, the Japanese group in which a CT-guided bronchoscopic injection, so real-time CT, guiding the bronchoscope tip adjacent to the lesion, injection of an indium barium dye that then could uh, be used at the time of video thoracoscopy to find a nodule that otherwise would be difficult to find at the time of resection. There's also a great report from Rafael Entrati from the University of Minnesota using electromagnetic navigationally placed fiducials to then guide video thoracoscopic resection of a very small pulmonary nodule that might be difficult to find. So the idea is that perhaps combinations of techniques may be useful for finding small nodules and for resection with minimizing uh, the lung that's removed. In the distant future, we also may have ways working together with you as thoracic surgeons to treat in a minimal invasive way small peripheral lung cancers for non-surgical candidates. This is a report from my colleague Felix Hurt from Heidelberg, which reviewed the current techniques in both animal and in human uh, models to treat peripheral lung cancers using ablative techniques like radiofrequency ablation and microwave technology. So what is the future? The future may well be in hybrid thoracic surgery, like it is in the hybrid cardiothoracic surgery for uh, uh, aortic valve replacement. So here you have a 79-year-old ex-smoker with severe COPD who presents the thor thoracic surgery with a 9 millimeter diameter lung nodule, which you can see here. Within 24 hours, you can perform a navigational bronchoscopy and an EBUS nodal staging procedure. The rapid on-site pathology team may be able to confirm a stage, a, stage 1A adenocarcinoma based upon an analysis of the nodule and nodes. And then you can concomitantly deliver a bronchoscopic ablative treatment with a microwave probe or guide uh, dye delivery or fiducials for a VATS sub-lobar resection. So for those of you familiar with old movies, this is Oklahoma. They had an argument between the farmer, that would be me, and the cowman, which would be John Karharczyk over here, over who should control the Oklahoma territory. And in the end, Aunt Eller, that's not you, Blair, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> decided that they should work together. And I think that, that can be the case, that we can develop techniques, that we can combine both of our expertise to help patients with pulmonary nodules to get optimum care uh, for them. So thank you very much for your time.